Man, it's good to see everybody here on a, a bright uh, midsummer Sunday. And man, this year's flying by already. Christmas is on the way. Maybe that, that may be getting a little ahead of ourselves. But man, I, you know, I hope that you're, uh, you're getting out and about this year. We missed so much last year, so even though, I, you know, it's no fun necessary to see a Sunday when somebody says, Pastor Kerry, I'm going to be gone, and, and we'll miss you, but uh, I'm glad to see people getting out and about and seeing the world and seeing family and, and reconnecting and having a good time. But when you get away and get that, that refreshment, uh, come back reinvigorated, be ready to plug in and serve because God's doing some great things here, and we want to make sure that every one of you uh, are a part of that. Uh, now, if you see me gimping around up here, I'll just sit it right up front because uh, uh, before the first service, I was rushing to do something, and I tripped down those stairs and took a tumble, and my ankle was like a softball. I spent between the services there with two popsicles uh, on my ankle back there uh, trying to get it to go down, so I can still move pretty well. I just can't stop, or it's, I think it's going to lock up on me, but anyway, that's that's a story for another day. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're in a series in the book of 1 Peter written by one of Jesus' closest followers when he was here on earth. And so it's something that uh, we definitely can learn something about following Jesus. So we want to take heed to what he says to us. Pastor Austin kicked off the, the series last week from 1 Peter chapter 1 talking about the issue of holiness. And how holiness is not something uh, that we do to gain God's favor. It's not something we pursue to enhance our own reputation. But the Bible calls us to be holy because God is holy. And he wants us to reflect his character and to show what he's like to a lost and dying world that they can see something in us that they need. And that's why he calls us uh, to be holy. Now, that's a little bit of a growing process because most of us aren't there to begin. How many of you know a lot more spiritual stuff and Bible stuff than you, than you live, than you put into practice? Anybody here with me on that? I've been to Bible college and, and, and beyond and I know lots of stuff. But I can tell you, I don't live all of it, but I strive to grow. And you know that word holiness? The same root word that comes from the word sanctification, and that's the theological term for a process of spiritual growth and development. And God calls us to that. And Peter mentions that at the beginning of uh, chapter two that we're not gonna look into, but I just wanna hit on that because Paul also talks a lot about the fact that we need to grow up in our faith and we need to mature. And he starts talking about in light of the fact he's called us to be holy as Pastor Austin preached, in light of the fact that he's given his life for us and all these things, it says you ought to live in a certain way. And it addresses some things individually, and then it starts to talk about collectively being built up together and maturing so that we're not just having the attitude when we come in here, you know, what's in this for me, what am I getting out of it? We're looking to serve. Our attitudes are changing, and we're seeing growth and progress uh, in our lives. And that, and that, takes, that takes time. I don't mind giving a baby a bottle. I just don't want to have to part their whiskers to do it. Okay, that ain't natural. You don't want to be like that, but that's, sometimes that's the way I get to, as a pastor, I got to be honest with you, sometimes I feel like I'm doing that to some people who should be beyond that, and just the same as that, uh, you know, that those baby faces may be cute, but if they were on a body like that, that looks a little out of place, okay? Maybe it's the beard, but uh, I thought, boy, I admire that. I can actually grow one, it's just not that color anymore, so that would be unnatural, we need to keep growing, we need to keep making spiritual progress, but in order to do that, we need to grasp certain things about God's intentions for us, and that's what he talks about in 1 Peter chapter two, and I'm gonna re begin reading in verse number nine. Now, when Pastor Manny was here, uh, uh, and I know you might mis mistake me for him, we look a lot alike, but I wanna do kind of something that he did that I liked. He, he had that responsive reading where he reads, and when he stops and pauses, you fill that in. Because there are certain key points that I want to highlight. I want you to get ingrained in your mind this morning. They're simple, but I want you to say them with me. So we're going to do it like that. And right before verse number 9, just to set a, a bit of a context, uh, Peter refers to uh, Jesus being looked at in two different ways. And to those uh, who follow him, he is a precious stone. He is valuable. He's worth staking their lives on. He's worth putting everything else aside like that pearl of great price. And you sell out to give everything to him. But to those who choose not to follow him, he is like a stumbling stone, 
because he gets in the way of their life. He disrupts the status quo. And sometimes that's a good litmus, litmus test of where we're at spiritually and where our lives are at. Uh, is, is your life, is it an interruption for the things that, that God asks us to do? And there were people like that and they were gonna miss out with God. But it starts in verse number nine and it says this, but you are not like that. For you are a people, you are royal priests, a nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show, that's an active word, show, the goodness of God for he has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Let me read a few more verses just to lay a bit more context. Continuing in verse 10, once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you receive no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. So dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors that even if they accuse you of doing wrong, and they will do that, no matter how good you live, no matter how much right you do. Sometimes I see the fact that Christians and churches are trying to get to the point where, where the world's cool with them and then they're gonna be relevant enough. They will never... They will always give us a hard time. But then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and will give honor to God when he judges the world. One day every, every person will give honor to God for what he's done. I want us to relook at verse number nine because that's where, the, where our focus is gonna land this morning. But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If you don't remember anything else that I say this morning, I want you to remember that you are chosen. I want you to remember by whom you are chosen and why you've been chosen. Because the God of all creation has looked down and said, I want you as part of what I'm doing. And he's chosen you to relate to him, to represent him, and to reflect his light to a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the fact that your blessing is already upon your word. God, I pray that it would be upon me as I expound just a little bit of it, uh, Lord, to the people this morning. And God, may your anointing be upon uh, their ears and their mind to hear and to receive what you would have them to. And may we be better people for the time we spend together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm coming for somebody here. Mark, you're about my age. Come here. Stand up. You know what to do. All right. I got first pick. That was one of the ways that, uh, little routines that we used for the terrible time-honored uh, uh, routine of picking teams. How many of you remember that in gym class, maybe in the sandlot, pick up games of ball, and you had two captains, and then they would start to pick teams, and one would say, uh, I'll take Craig, I'll take Jeff, I'll take Brett, I'll take Mike, and it was a go on, you'd, you'd try to kind of act like it didn't really matter and you'd be kind of shooting the breeze of the people next to you, but honestly you were relieved when you got picked. Because if you had any heart at all, you had to feel for the people who, for whatever reason, maybe they just weren't good at that sport or, or whatever the thing was you were picking for, and they were down at the end of the line. And I remember sometimes, you know, as, as they went along, it got a little bit slower because they were not only deciding who they wanted, they were deciding who they didn't want. And I remember times when it would come down to like the third to the last person, and the captain would say, uh, uh, I'll take Marlon. And then we'd turn to the other captain and say, you can take the last two. He didn't even want one of them. I mean, this, this was a terrible, rigid, in this day of cultural sensitivity, that ought to be outlawed. Do they even, I don't even know if they do that kind of thing anymore. Because some people have been left with a lasting impression. I mean, maybe not something as frivolous as that, but maybe so. But maybe a lot more significant times when they weren't chosen. And here's the irony. In a culture that is so success-driven and success-oriented, more people defend, tend to define themselves not by their successes, 
but by the failures, and not even just their own, but times when they felt rejected and neglected and disparaged and disregarded and overlooked or simply not chosen. Not chosen for the the team, not chosen for the club, not chosen for the award, the, the job promotion, not picked as a friend or a spouse, not given the opportunity that you may have worked hard for and see somebody else get some that never came your way. And to this day, that still affects the perception you have of yourself. It affects your attitude toward others and even your outlook in general on life because you're still looking at through that lens of rejection. But you know who can relate to ultimate rejection? God's son, through whom the world was created, was rejected by his own creation. In fact, I want to remind you that he was rejected because of what he did for you and me. And yet he looked down through time and space and all eternity and said, I want you. I choose you. Before you ever lined up, before you ever realized you were getting into the game, the Bible says while we were yet sinners, separated from him, isolated from him, alienated, he gave his life for us because he wants you on his team and this morning we're going to talk about the fact that he has chosen you because no matter uh, who or how or when you've been rejected or isolated or disregarded or not chosen by people God has chosen you to be part of a special purpose we are his chosen people that's point number one we are a chosen people genos ekleton Ekleton, we are called out, a called out gathering. And, and genus, we'll talk about what that means, but uh, it's one translation talks about chosen generation. Some people think the better translation is that we are an elect race. Now, I don't necessarily like that as well, especially the implications that that carries today because race has become a dividing line for so many people. But with God's kingdom, we know that it's upside down from the world's ways. And God is calling for himself a people from all nationalities, from all races, from all walks of life, and making them a chosen people based on their faith in him. But here's what I really like about that word, and here's how I like to look at it. How many of you remember science class back in junior high, high school, learning like the the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom? Those are the big things, and from there it goes down. I still, for some odd reason, remember this thing. It goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That term not only implies that we are a people, not just implies a race, it literally is talking about a new kind of creation. Now does that sound familiar? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And we are born again in that sense spiritually, not born of the, of the flesh, but born of the spirit. And that's a powerful term when we think uh, that we are born again. But you know, the Bible uses another term to describe how we come into God's family. It may not seem as spiritual or as deep as being born again. It talks about it a lot when it, when it refers to Gentiles, those outside of the Jews where God's chosen people is referred to throughout scripture. But he talks about being adopted into his family. Now when I was growing up, for some reason, adoption, I don't know, carried a little bit of a stigma. Uh, Kids, if they knew it, didn't always want to tell that they were adopted. Parents would kind of wonder, when do I tell my kids that they're adopted? And I don't, just some kind of, as if we thought that maybe it was not quite a first class part of the family. But there's something special uh, of referring to adoption because there is an aspect that you are chosen. Now, how many of you know when you have kids the old-fashioned way, you pretty much you get what, what you got? You take what you get, and that's about all you can say, say about it. Anybody here ever had a little buyer's remorse over the years of that? Okay? Somewhere between the, you know, the, the few months when they're keeping you up all night and the, the junior high time when they're just on your nerves uh, constantly, uh, you might have wished you could take them back for an exchange or a refund. But it doesn't work that way. Parents the same way, all right? And kids didn't even get the choice. They really had to get, to get what they got. But with adoption, there is a chosenness. And, and as differing even from worldly adoption, with God, it's reciprocal because he not only chose us, he gives us the opportunity to choose him back. 
And I want you to grasp that fact, and I don't ever want you to underestimate what God can do with you, what he's put within you, and how he can use. Maybe it's your connections, maybe your particular skills, your personality, interests that you have that are just unique to you, uh, your pain and, and, and the hurt you've had in your life. God can use that in a way that's unique just to you. And he has a purpose for you to complete that, that nobody else can do quite as well as he's made you to do. Don't ever underestimate that. Don't sell yourself short and feel, well, God needs a certain type of people uh, that he can use. He doesn't. Look throughout scripture. He chose a deceiver uh, like Jacob uh, to be renamed Israel. Uh, he chose to be uh, the greatest king, a ruddy youth named David. He chose a stutterer who had trouble communicating uh, named Moses to communicate to God's people and give us a good chunk of the word that we have to this day. He used Gideon, who was the least in his family and his tribe, to win uh, mighty battles for the Lord. He used a prostitute named Rahab to save his people and to eventually become part of Jesus' own lineage. So never compromise that purpose that God has for you. There is, there is something that you are accountable to do that nobody else, you don't have to do what I do. You don't have to do what Pastor uh, Jeff does. You're not gonna stand before God one day and he say to you, well, you did pretty well, but uh, not, not, not quite Austin Weaver well, but, uh, but you know, you, you did okay. No, that isn't the way it works. You fulfill that purpose that he created you for and he's gonna look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. If only you make yourself available to him. Don't hide that talent. Don't hide that ability like that servant who was given so little. He thought, well, I'm not going to do, what can I do with this? And he buried it in the earth. That was the one that, that Jesus rebuked and didn't let into his kingdom. But if we make those things available to God, if we become that instrument in his hand, that tool, that unique, special tool. How many of you guys who work on things know that when you've got a task to do, you've got to have just the right tool? Nothing else will do. Maybe you, you like to cook, you're in the kitchen, you gotta have the right utensil. The other day, uh, I was moving my daughter's stuff into my house. I moved it out again this weekend when I moved it to Rochester, Minnesota. But uh, the couch would not go in the house with those feet on it. Now, I had to take the feet off. Well, I could not find what would take those feet off for anything. A little Allen wrench or something in there. It wasn't long enough, wasn't the right shape, whatever. It took me about a half hour. I looked through my whole 150-piece mechanics tool set, and there wasn't one thing in there, and I finally found an Allen wrench in the bathroom in the drawer that worked because only that thing would take those off. And it wasn't for that. That couch would still be sitting outside my garage. It would have been soaked with rain a couple times over and ruined because I needed that one tool. A couple weeks before that, I was working on my lawnmower. Hit something hard, bent the blade, so I'm taking off the, the flywheel. I didn't have the right tool, and I broke something. And so it sat there, and I'm looking at lawnmowers and about ready to drop four or $500 for a new one. I thought, I'm gonna try one more time. So I finally looked, got just the right socket to take off that thing, and I discovered that what had happened is it sheared off this little $2 piece. I go in the hardware store and get four of them for $5, and fixed my lawnmower, it's worked three or four times since and it's still going strong. Now you might feel like you're that three for four dollar part, but I don't care when God has a specific uh, purpose for you and something that needs to be done and he says that's the person I choose to do it and you're the only one who can do it that way. He needs you and you need to be available. Don't ever sell yourself short because God has chosen you. It's no mistake that you are here and even at this place in time. Does, does anybody here ever feel like you were born just at the wrong time? Maybe your personality, the th your interest. No, that isn't the way it is. God has placed you here and now in this body, at your workplace, for, within your family unit, because you are the right person for the job. You are the right tool for the task. And God wants to use you if you'll just make yourself available. Because this generation of Christians is responsible for, for this generation uh, of people in the world. That's where the, the translation generation comes in. I like it. Because a generation implies something for a specific place and time. God has a specific place and time for you, and it's right here and now, and he wants you to be available to him to represent and to reach him for others. And that brings me to the second part of this, the fact that we are royal priests, or a royal priesthood. Now, in the Old Testament, the priesthood was very restrictive and exclusive. It was just uh, relegated to men, 
of the tribe of Levi and Aaron's family. And only they could fill that role. And the people would bring them the sacrifices and they'd make sacrifices to God and they would mediate between the God and, and, and the people because there wasn't that open access. But all of that changed with Jesus. And the Bible says that when he died, one the gospel describes that the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that veil was what separated the holy place from the most holy place. And that place, only one priest could go into. That was a high priest and one time a year. But he said, that's torn away. And now we have access. Two weeks ago, I was at uh, the nation's capital. I've been there many times before. I remember the first time I went there, I went right to the capital. Went right up to the stairs, and I sat there. was able to take pictures and everything. It was great. It was really cool. But this last time that I went, there was a fence there. About a block and a half away was all the closer I could get because it was restricted. That fence has since come down. I think it came down this week. But my, my thinking was this. Fence or no fence, do any of you like me feel that you got very little access or influence with the powers that be on earth that separated from us? But I tell you what, no matter how connected you feel to the powers in this world, you have full access, any place, any time, for any reason, to the king of the universe. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that we can come boldly before his throne to obtain mercy and help in our time of need. We've got that access because we are royal priests. I, that term royal priest, the priesthood and the kingship are always separate throughout the Bible. You could be the most powerful king of God's people. You still needed to get access through the priest. You could be uh, the most godly priest or prophet, and you still had a king over you because those were separated. There was one guy back in the Old Testament, mentions him, uh, I think just one time in passing uh, in the Old Testament, talks about Melchizedek, and Abraham gave tithes to him, and that was kind of a weird thing to, to do as if he was in a place of God. But, but it says later in the New Testament that Jesus was after the order of Melchizedek because he filled both the role of king and priest. And now as God's children, we also have that dual role. We are royalty because we're his children. We are his representatives because we're priests. Because the access that we have now is not only for ourselves, but we have access to be ambassadors and intercessors for other people who don't know him. Now, they have access for themselves, but they don't know it. And I can tell you what, most people are not going to find that in here because that's not where they're looking. Most people are not going to first uh, step foot through the doors of this church. The way that they're going to see it is through you. And you need to reflect the image of Christ. Pastor Austin talked about it last week. The reflection always draws attention back to the original. Do you live in such a way that when people look at your life, they don't just see you, they see Jesus. They may not know it's Jesus, but they see something different enough in you that they can say, you know what, maybe that's what I've been looking for. Maybe that's what I need. We are that royal priesthood. But in order to reflect that kind of character, we need what Pastor Austin talked about last week, and that is holiness. And God says that you are a holy nation. Being chosen, the Bible often links to holiness. When it chooses, it says that, that something is chosen as a, as a vessel or an instrument. When, when they were laying out the furnishings of the temple, or anytime God refers to that, uh, there is an issue where chosenness is linked to holiness. It does that in Ephesians 1, 4, where it says, just as he chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, I mentioned before that holiness and sanctified are kind of come from the same term. And, and what those mean is simply that we are set apart. We are called out and we are set apart. We are called out from the ordinary ways of this world and set apart for a special purpose that God has for us. Here's what I want you to get uh, of holiness, and I'm not going to linger long on it. But Pastor Manny said something that I've been, every time I deal with holiness, I almost bring this in when he said it. I said, that's right, that's what we need to grasp. That the opposite of holiness is not the vile, ungodly, reprobate, terrible, terrible things. The opposite of holiness is the common. And the prophet Ezekiel told the priests of his day that God's people needed to learn the difference between the holy and the common. Just the ordinary 
just what was acceptable to everybody else in the world. Because I can tell you this, the things that are popular, the things that are acceptable, the things that the world spends their time on doing and entertainment and whatever else that takes, those things, I can almost guarantee you, are not God's best intention for you. And more often than not, those are just worthless things. The, the prophet Jeremiah uh, told the people his day, God spoke to him and said, the reason that they fell away from me and never returned to him for decades, it says simply they followed worthless things. And because of that, they became worthless themselves. Not that they weren't worth something to God, but their effectiveness as God's people had been lost because they gave attention to worthless things. And we need to take heed to that and understand that there are some things we need to avoid because it compromises that uncommon purposes. And there are things that we need to pursue because it allows us to fill that uncommon purpose. But that means that we need to live with the difference. And that brings me to the last part of what this says here. And that's the part of the verse that if you remember in the old King James that says that we are a peculiar people. Now if you look to your right or to your left, you might say, yeah, that, that sums it up pretty well. All right, that's about this crowd here. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean odd or strange. It simply means that we are different enough. We are distinct. We live in such a way that it's as distinct as light from darkness because that's what we're to be. We're to be children of light. The translation we have says that we are God's very own possession. And those words there literally mean to be over and above the ordinary. How many, how many of you know if something belongs to God, the stuff in his house is a little more special than anywhere else? It's, it's uncommon, it's not ordinary because we don't belong to the world. We are God's very own possession. We are identified with this son Jesus, we are in his care, and we are reserved for his purpose. And what is that purpose? What it sums up the end of that verse, it says that we should proclaim or show or show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his glorious light. You know, if your translation just says to proclaim the pra praises, that's, that's not quite enough. It doesn't get the whole picture because the word is to show or to show forth. A while ago, we were singing our praises. We're gonna go back into a worship time in just a minute. But you know what? Praise isn't just lyrics of a song that we sing when we come to church. That's not where the, what the Bible talks about, the sacrifice of praise. That shouldn't be any big sacrifice. It's not easy all the time, but the place where the real sacrifice takes place is when we go out of these doors and we live in such a way that does what those songs sing and we're simply declaring of our lives, God, we do exalt you, we do honor you, we make you great in the way that we live because people can see us. We need to worship and show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. You know, that term says something very unique. The only place in the New Testament where this word used for show uh, happens, and it literally means this. It means to proclaim to those without what has happened within. In other words, it needs to show to people outside of this what has taken place inside of us. People should be able to see what Jesus has done in us. The book of Esther talks about um, a guy named Haman wanted to do away with God's people. And the way he made his case is he came to the king and said, Oh, king, there's a people scattered and throughout all the provinces of your kingdom whose ways and customs are different from all other people. And it's not in your best interest to tolerate them. And I thought when I first come across this years and years and years ago, I thought, well, I sure, sure we're different. You know, uh, the Jewish people had their ways, their customs. They had their religious festivals and routines and rituals and gathering synagogue and all this kind of stuff. But this was written during a time when they were in exile. They had been taken captive and all those things were stripped away. And yet something was still distinct enough in their life to where a person said, there is something really different here. I don't know if we should put up with that. And I want to challenge you to think, think about this. Strip away all the things that we rely on for our, our Christian reputation testimony. Take away our ability to gather in this place together. We saw how fragile that could be. Take away what you know of God's word except what you've hidden up here. Take away uh, your ability to, you know, that you're so I believe that I, I hang out with these Christian people, whatever. Strip all that away. Is there still something different enough in your life, in your character, in your conduct that we, people would look at you and say there's something different about them? Because if that's not the case, then why would any of the world see anything that they need in us? Why would they see any need at all to change? 
God has called us out. God has not called us to see how close to the edge that we can get in our behavior because that's the one thing. Verse number 11 went on to say, don't do these things that war against your soul, these common ordinary things. There is warfare going on in the heavenly, supernatural realm all around us that we need to be wise to. But you know what? The biggest battle, the most subtle and destructive and deceptive battle is a lot of times what goes on in us. Because we compromise with the ordinary. We compromise with questionable things. We fill our time just with common stuff. And God has called us out for a higher purpose. And he wants you to be part of that purpose. As followers of Christ, as children of God, as priests to the Lord, our lives should stand out as distinct as light from darkness because that's what God has called us to be, light in a dark world. The rest of the chapter simply goes on to talk about some of the ways we do that. Talks about living such good lives uh, among a, a godly people that they look at you and able to see the difference that Jesus makes. You know, the world talks about compassion and serving and do all this, thing, but if Christians are actually the ones out there doing it, maybe they'll rethink all the labels they put on us. It talks about showing kindness and respect to everybody, even including the authorities you don't agree with. Because we'll stand out doing that. It even talks about uh, the relationship of slaves and masters. Not to condone that in any way, but to say in this world you're going to encounter injustice. You're going to be out of control. There's going to be a lot of things that are oppressive to you, especially as my people. But even in the midst of the worst situations, your light uh, can show through you. You can represent me and reflect me to a lost and dying world. Because God has chosen you He's chosen you for a specific purpose, and that purpose is to relate to him, to represent him, and to reflect his light to a lost and dying world. But in order to do that, we need to grasp the fact that we are chosen and called out for a special purpose by God. Now, most of you here have responded to that call. You're children of light, you're following him. But to be quite honest, you're still kind of living in the shadows. You're not fully reflecting his light because maybe it's the issue of holiness. Not just the do's and don'ts, but the fact that you need to have a character more like Jesus. You need to take on that priestly role so you step in and you begin to represent and reflect his light to a lost and dying world. And today, you need to step out and say, I'm going to make that change. I want when people see me, I want them to see the original. Whether they know it or not, I want them to see something that different in my life. There are others of you here today who are still living in the shadows because of something that's happened to you in the past, maybe on multiple times, but you're still living with that perception that you've been shortchanged because of times that you weren't chosen, because of times when you were disregarded and denied and overlooked. And today, you need to grasp the fact that you are a child of God. You are a child of the King, and He has a special purpose for you. And you, too, are meant to reflect His light to the world around you. And today, you need to step out and make a declaration. I say, you know what? I'm not letting any of this stuff stop me anymore. I don't care what's happened to you or, or what you've done or what's been done to you. God is calling you out for that special purpose because He wants you to reflect that light. And in just a moment... You're going to come and you're going to stand here and make that declaration as you worship. Worship team, would you come? And I want to say one more thing to those here today who understand, and maybe you knew this already, maybe this morning something was said that says, you know, I, I am. God has chosen me. I can't believe that, but he has. But you have not made the decision to choose him. And today you can, you can acknowledge, I've gone my own way. That's what sin is. And that separates us from God, prevents us from that relationship. And you say, you know what? I'm ready to acknowledge that. I confess my sin to him. I believe Jesus is the son of God who died in my place to pay the price for that sin, rose from the dead with the power and authority to give me a new life. And I receive that, that life today. And I want to become a child of God. And with every other head bowed, I just want to look around you to catch my eye. If that's you this morning, would you look up? I want to know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to, I'm not going to single you out or embarrass you, but, but God wants you to take that bold stand and say, I, I identify with Christ because he gave his life for me. And if you heard, I'm going to look across from, from right to left. And, and if, you, if that's you, lift your head and just catch my eye. I want to pray for you this morning. Okay. Yeah, 
I see, I see a handful of people looking. I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these who responded, who are now, you've chosen them before the creation of the world. You knew them. You've got a purpose for them, and today they're responding to that. They're jumping on, on, on your ship. Lord, you've destined that those who follow you are going to be in heaven one day with you. But Lord, it's our choice if we're going to jump on and, and, and get on that ship and trust our lives to you. And today they're doing that. God, you're making them your child. You are setting them apart for your purpose. And Lord, I pray right now that they will grasp that purpose. They will understand that they are forgiven, that they are a child of God. And Lord, they're going to start looking to your word for the purpose to find out who you are, to become more like you and to follow your ways. They're going to tie into a church like this, Lord, where they can begin to plug in and get involved and begin to grow alongside others who are serving you. And I thank you for that. I pray it in Jesus' name. I want you to stand right now. I'm going to ask you this, and I don't want you to hesitate because this is an opportunity. An altar represents a place of encounter with God, and we're making a declaration today. And if you fit one of those things today and said, you know what, I need to take a stand and step into that priestly role, and I need to start reflecting Christ in a greater way so people don't just see me, they see Jesus. I'm going to ask you to step out for where you are and make that declaration and say, I'm doing that today. And especially if you're here today and you just haven't grasped the fact that you're chosen and some perception you have from yourself, of yourself, from what's happened in the past has just held you back from reflecting Christ as you can. You say, I'm not putting up with that anymore. I'm chosen by the King. And you're going to declare that today. I want you to step out right now from your seat right now as we begin to worship. And we're going to spend just a couple minutes just worshiping God and declaring that we are chosen by Him. We're not forsaken by anybody else. He's chosen us and we're His people. So as we worship, would you just step up your, your seat and worship at this altar and let's declare that we are God's chosen people and we're going to fulfill the purpose He has for us. We need Him. We can't do it on our own strength. We can't be holy without Him. We can't be righteous because it's all Him. It's not us. God has chosen you. You need to be ready to be part of His purpose. You tie into a place in this church, if you're not involved in a group, if you're not involved in a ministry or someplace using what God has put within you to do, find that place, plug in, be a part of God's people. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we, we'd like you to be a part of this church. There's a place where you'll start growing. Get into God's Word. Start reading one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Look at the life of Jesus and just begin to imitate what you see there because we need Him to be everything He's called us to be. The Lord bless you as you go this morning. Whenever I tell people that, I say, God bless us, go with us, but look where God is going. Get on his tails and follow him because uh, that's adventure. That's a life God intends for you. That's not a boring life. Go with God today. Come back tonight. Powerful things always happen on Sunday night. We'd love to see you there. Kids activities just started up, so families coming out Sunday night, there's something for everybody. And the Lord bless you as you go.